Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 10. And we are closing and we want to close with a message that I want to entitle the order of the blessing. Just wherever you are, don't go far. <laughs> yeah, uh, the book of Proverbs chapter 10. And verse 22. And it reads thus. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Now, when we talk about the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus, I want us to understand the essence of what a blessing is. And, and the Bible here in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, gives us an indication of what happens when a person is blessed. So in other words, if you are going to enjoy the blessing from God, we don't expect you to be stressed all the time. It's not a blessing if it gives you sleepless nights. It's not a blessing if, if you can't have peace and joy about it. That's what Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 is teaching us. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Of course, maybe a little bit of a background uh, of the book of Galatians. That's where we are going to take our text today. And we are looking specifically at the theme of the year, which is the theme of the conference as well, verse 13. But a little bit of a background on the book of Galatians. So, Paul goes to Galatia. He preaches the gospel there. And the Galatians receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, just like all of us need to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, when Paul leaves, there are other Jews that come into Galatia and they start preaching a contrary gospel. And the gospel that they preach is that people should observe the law of Moses. Part of it is they need to be circumcised in order for them to be saved. And so when Paul heard about this, he writes this letter to the Galatians now with raised concerns about this issue. People can be saved from the law and still go back to it. So that's basically what Paul is talking about. Now, I love his approach. I love his approach in chapter 3 because he talks about the fact that, you know, uh, faith is what justified Abraham before God. Okay, so uh, let's start a little bit about uh, on, on a theological background. So don't, don't, don't be patient with me. It will make sense as we continue. So uh, he starts in, in, he actually explains in chapter three that, you know, it is by faith that we are able to get justified before God. And he quotes the scripture that you find in Genesis chapter 15. You know, Abraham believed God. I think it's verse six. Abraham believed God and was credited to him for righteousness. And he says, that's key right there. That's key. And so the argument of Paul, especially with regards to the issue of circumcision, is he's looking at the time frame at which circumcision was introduced. So he's saying to us, anything that was given to Abraham as a promise, he received it by faith. Circumcision comes later on when the promise has been fulfilled, which means faith is no longer necessary. That is why then you cannot attach circumcision to faith. Because faith talks about I'm anticipating something. But circumcision says it has already arrived. So his argument is if we are going to walk by faith, then we don't need to follow the law of Moses because the law is not of faith. That's his argument in chapter 3. So I'm going to take the same argument and turn it around and switch it around and show you that there is another side of it. So in the book of Galatians, then he's dealing with this issue that, you know, the law of Moses cannot necessarily be concurrent with Christ because uh, Christ becomes the end of the law. And so that is what he's trying to prove out of the book of Galatians. Now, uh, when you go to, maybe let's just go to, to verse 13 that we are, we are looking at today. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
Okay, so he's saying we are redeemed from, we are redeemed into. That's the argument that Paul is bringing. We are redeemed from the law of Moses. We are redeemed into the blessing of Abraham. And the argument that he brings is that Abraham received this blessing before the law was given. So the law cannot necessarily be part of the package. See, I wonder what's a lot. Now, let, let's take another approach to this. So he says to us, uh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we might become, uh, rather the blessing of Abraham might come to us Gentiles. So what I want to talk to you about today is the order of a blessing. The order of a blessing. Somebody say the order of a blessing. When we talk about the order of a blessing, a child of God, we are talking a priestly language. Okay. We are talking a priestly language. What am I talking about? Uh, when you go to the book of Pesalums, maybe let's just turn there. Pesalums chapter 110. Pesalums 110. And we are looking specifically at verse, verse 4. Now, the book of Psalms 110 is actually a messianic prophecy. If you want to know what a messianic prophecy is, it is a prophecy that speaks about Christ in the Old Testament. So it is messianic in its nature that, uh, it, because it's referring to Christ. And this is, this is what it says. Psalms chapter 110 and verse 4. It says, The Lord has sown and will not relent. Another version would say he will not repent. In other words, he will not change from this. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So when we talk about order, we are talking about a priestly language. We are talking something that, is, that has a priestly essence in it. I hope I'm making sense, Pastor Lord. I, I told you it's going to be theological. Just hang, 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 hang there with me. It's going to make sense as we continue. So when we talk about order, uh, the, the same, the same Psalm chapter 110 verse 4, it's taken up by the writer of the book of Hebrews. We are not sure exactly who it is. I've got my allegation. I believe it's Paul, but we, we will argue that some other time. So the, the book of uh, Hebrews, the writer says to, to us in chapter 7, uh, the same Psalm 110 is actually referring to Christ. So he's proving to us that it's Jesus that is being referred to here. And in, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 7, of course, he explains to us who this Melchizedek is. Because he felt the need, the necessity. If, if Christ is going to be compared to Melchizedek, then he felt the necessity to, uh, for us to understand who Melchizedek is. That is why then he put so much effort into explaining. So in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1 he says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Okay, we're going to come back to that. So we are still looking at the key word there which is order. So in Hebrews chapter 7, the entire chapter he's dedicating it to explaining who Melchizedek is and how he relates to Christ. Amen. Okay, so when we talk about the word order, uh, you find this actually in the same book of Hebrews chapter 7 verse 21. He's quoting from, from Psalm 110. He says, the Lord has sown and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, so the Greek word there that actually is translated order. In Greek, it's actually the word texis, like, like texis, like texis. Yes, so it's the word texis. And this word actually talks about a regular arrangement. The word order talks about a regular arrangement. That is an, an irregular arrangement in time. So it's something that is just like your clock. You know that second uh, horn in your clock, uh, that, that hand, that, that counts seconds. It's, it's going, going in a consistent timing. So that's what order is talking about. It's talking about a regular arrangement in time. It also talks about a fixed succession. So it's something that happens continually. It's a succession, but it's fixed. You know, but this thing is progressive, but it's not going to change its tempo. It's not going to change its pace. It's going to be a fixed succession. See, I want to mess around. So it's talking about a fixed succession of rank or character. A fixed succession of rank or character. So in other words, Melchizedek has a particular rank. And Jesus is placed in the same rank. Of Melchizedek. It's a fixed succession of a particular rank. See, I wonder what's a lot. Okay, it also talks about official dignity. 
It also talks about official dignity. And here is the reason why I'm taking my time in this. Because when we look at the man called Melchizedek in the Bible, I know there are types and anti-types in the Bible. There are, there are a number of things that we can look at, you know, that talks about the fact that Melchizedek kind of like represented Christ. Right? Many people make a mistake of thinking Melchizedek was actually Christ in the Old Testament. That's not true. If I had enough time, I was going to deal with you. The, every time Christ appeared in the Old Testament, he appeared as an angel called the Lord. That's, that's the angel that met Gideon. That's the angel that met Abraham, you know, when before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. That's the angel that, you know, keeps on appearing, met Manoah before the birth of Samson, you know, and all that. So the Lord, that angel called the Lord, is actually Christ in the Old Testament. He took a form of an angel. But Melchizedek was actually a human being. He was actually a human being. And when you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 7, of course, he talks about he has no genealogy, no mother, no father, but resembling. When he talks about resembling, he talks about the fact that he, he kind of like portrays the son of God. It's not necessarily saying he is the son of God. Why is this important? Because Melchizedek was actually a Gentile. He was a Canaanite. He was a Canaanite king. So when we talk about the blessing of Abraham, Barcelona, when you fast forward to Genesis chapter 14, Melchizedek meets Abraham coming from the slaughter of kings. He has bread and wine. Now, I don't have ta enough time to prove you that every time you see bread and wine in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it's talking about Christ. Christ explained that in the, in the Last Supper, that actually when you see bread and wine, it's talking about me. Okay, so when Melchizedek comes to Abraham having bread and wine, he's actually coming with the gospel message, if I may put it that way. He's coming to Abraham with the gospel message, and he gives Abraham a double-fold blessing. Blessed be, be Abraham, servant of the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abraham responds by giving him a tithe. Now, let's go back to the priestly order. Because the Bible says to us, he is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, here is the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm relating the reason that uh, the fact that Melchizedek is a Gentile. Because if, if Abraham received a blessing from Melchizedek, who is a Gentile, it means the gospel message did not originate from Jews. Oh God. If, if Abraham received a blessing from Melchizedek, whom the Bible says he's the priest of the Most High, then the gospel message did not originate with the Jews. The gospel message originated with Gentiles. Oh God, I wish I had enough time to, to work on this. I wish I had enough time. So the Canaanites were actually closely related to Africans. I, I'm, not, I'm not into debates, Barcelona, okay? I know I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an apologetic, but not today. Uh, the, the Canaanites are closely related. In fact, we are a family of four. You know, you've got Put, Kush, uh, Mizraim, and Canaan. They are all descendants from the same father. So the Canaanites are closely, in other words, they were dark-skinned. They were closely related to black people. Okay, the Canaanites. Now, the Canaanites, of course, God declared that he's going to remove them from their land and he will place Israelites. But before that, the, what happened is they allowed some foreigners to come into the land and polluted them. That's why we had giants like Abu, Abu Goliath and all that. So by the time Israel came to take over, they were a mixed race. I'm not going to have enough time to deal with that. Don't worry. I know it's theological, Bazalwani. Come with me, you will get there. Okay, so every time God wants to bless the Israelites, he would take them to Africa. Uh, it started with Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, and there was famine in the land, and Abraham went to Egypt. Chapter 13, when he cuts out of Egypt, Abraham was rich in silver, in gold, and in livestock. Where does it come from? From Africa. When God sends them into prison, into Egypt, to serve the Egyptians for how many years? For 400 and years. In fact, Paul says 430 years in Galatians chapter 3. When, he, when they got out of the land, God says to them, tell your masters to give you silver and gold. They walked out there with the riches of Africa. 
when God wanted to preserve Christ during the time of a crisis, he sent Jesus to Africa. Why? Because the original blessing that Abraham got is related to Africans. Woo! Uh, I'm, I'm going to work on this. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm going to work on it. You're going to get something out of this. So when Jesus comes then, the Bible says he's the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? It means now you can never re really relate Christ to the Jewish system. Why? Because the order of Melchizedek is different from the Jewish system. Okay, let's, let's, let's visit the Jewish system a little bit. So, when God appoints the, the children of Israel, he appoints them from 12 tribes. Again, right. The 12 tribes now, from the tribe called Levi, that's where you get the priests. And every time you find a king in Israel, he's either descended from Judah or from any other tribe. Especially the, Jew, the, 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 the tribe of Judah. So you always find kings descended from Judah. You always find priests descended from uh, Levi. And according to the law of Moses, these two are not supposed to mix. That is why uh, the, the argument of the person who wrote the book of Hebrews says, Levi actually is lower than Melchizedek in that he was still in the loins of Abraham when Abraham gave tithe. So in other words, the system of Melchizedek is superior to that of the Jews. Now, Jesus is descendant from Judah, but the Bible calls him a high priest, which means the order has been mixed. And every time you mix the order, you nullify the law. That is why, child of God, you cannot walk under the law as a Christian, because the law has been nullified by Christ, who is both a king and a priest. Oh... I, can I preach like I feel it this morning? So what God is saying to us then is that when he says you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus then brings a turnaround of these things. The blessing originates from a Gentile into the Jewish nation. And when Jesus comes, he says there is no more Jew, nor Greek, nor Gentile, which means it has come full circle. Uh, you are more deserving of a blessing of Abraham than the Jews themselves. That's where I'm taking you. That's where I'm taking you. So in other words, this blessing originally belonged to you. It was borrowed to the Jew for a, for, for a particular period of time until Christ comes and restores it back to you. Ooh. Can I preach like I feel it this morning? So when we talk about the order of a blessing, child of God, we are talking about the fact that there is a particular priesthood that needs to come into play and change things around. So from the moment you receive Christ in your life, you are blessed. You don't need to go to some Sangoma for it. You are blessed already because this blessing originally belonged to you. And whenever God wants to do something in your life, he will refer back to the blessing that he has put on you. Maybe, maybe let's define a blessing so that we don't, we don't waste it. What is a blessing? Now, a blessing is defined this way from the, from the principle of first use. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting done with the theological part, Basil, and just don't do it. From, from the, the principle of uh, first use, when you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, it talks about God creating, you know, the animals of the earth and everything, and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Again. When you go to verse 28, the same concept comes in. God creates man in his own image and likeness, and he blesses them and he says, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. So every time you see the word bless, from its original use, it's always associated with fruitfulness and multiplication. That's the principle of first use. It says, whenever you see a word used first in the scripture, look at its context because that context will not change for the rest of the Bible. The word may be applied differently, but the essence of the word is still the same. So when we talk about a blessing, we are talking about fruitfulness and multiplication. Now, the, the general definition of a blessing is that a blessing is an empowerment to success. It's an empowerment to succeed. So if, if God is going to bless you, he's going to actually empower you to succeed, which means it's an, a supernatural enablement to achieve results. Amen, Mazalot? 
Okay, now, the third definition I'm going to give you, I'm not going to have time, I'm not going to go through many others. The third one that, 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 that we can give is coming from the BD Chutes. When we talk about the BD Chutes, we are talking about uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 talks about blessed are the, the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are broken hearted and all that. And all. That's what we call the beatitudes. Now, if we define a blessing taking the essence of the beatitudes, then a blessing becomes... <clears throat> I'm sorry. A blessing is, is God's turnaround strategy. That's what a blessing is. It's God's turnaround strategy. Because the Bible says, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. By nature, the meek are supposed to be despised. By nature, the meek are supposed to be trampled down. But God is saying, I've got a turnaround strategy for you. Because when you are meek, you will inherit the earth. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, according to nature, when you are hungry, you are hungry, you are empty. But God says you are blessed because you stand an opportunity for me to turn things around in your life. So there is a turnaround strategy that God calls a blessing. Oh, come on, someone. Somebody say a turnaround strategy. Now, how do we obtain this blessing? Let's go to, to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we are looking at verse 3. The book of Ephesians. It says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So what, 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 the first, what, what Ephesians chapter 1 is saying to us is that whenever you connect your life to Christ, you are already blessed. Because he has blessed us in Christ before the foundations of the earth. So in other words, the blessing that you have been looking for is found in Christ. All you need to do is to connect yourself to Christ. It's, it's, it's like electricity. How to get a lamid? When you have a, a, a water boiling kettle, as long as you hold it in your hands, it's not going to boil the water. You can pray in tongues, you can do whatever. That, that water is not going to boil until you plug it into electricity. For as long as you are not yet plugged into Christ, you will never experience a blessing. You can call it something else. You can, you can go to Inyanga for it. You can do what? Well, it's not a blessing because the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he adds no sorrow in it. So if you have, have, to, if you have to go to somewhere, that's sorrow. Come on. It's not a blessing from God. If you are going to go to somewhere where you have to revive it every time, that's not a blessing from the Lord. Because a blessing from God, he adds no sorrow in it. I hope I'm talking to somebody. So when we talk about a blessing, we are talking about God's uh, supernatural turnaround strategy. And God is saying, I've got a blessing for you in Christ Jesus. How do, then do I activate the blessing that is in Christ Jesus? Number one, I have to believe that I am blessed. I have to believe that I am blessed. You see, half the time we are looking for blessings while we already have them. And that's where the problem is. Just as you are born again, born, how polos are you lift up your hands, you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you receive him in your life. Nothing changes on the outside. But you have to believe that you are born again. You have to believe that you are born again. The same applies. You have to believe that as long as I'm born again, I'm blessed. It starts with you believing that you are blessed, that you will start to activate the blessing in your life. So the first thing is to believe that, I, that you are blessed. Amen. The second thing then is to confess that you are blessed. You have to speak it out, Nzalwane. Because when God created the universe, he used the power of words. And the Bible tells us that the power of life and death lies in the tongue. You can be blessed and talk a different language. Your language should comply to the blessing that God has given you. I hope I'm making sense to somebody. So, number one, you have to believe that you are blessed. Number two, you have to confess that you are blessed. And number three, you have to give because you are blessed. Yeah, that's the one that we don't want to hear again. You have to give because you are blessed. You see, as long as you are still having a mentality of I need to receive, you have not yet activated the blessing in you. 
That is why God designed a tithe system so that we can put him first. Why? Because he wants to penetrate our finances. And as long as you don't allow God's space to control your finances, you will still struggle. Remember yesterday we were talking about pride. As long as you think you've got this, you will struggle financially until you tap into God's system. And God will show you that when you are insufficient, I am your sufficiency. Are we together, Barcelona? Now, let's talk about the visible results of a blessing. When we talk about the visible results of a blessing, we have seen in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, he adds no sorrow in it. In other words, number one, wealth will follow you. If you are blessed, wealth will follow you. I'm not talking about magic. It's not going to happen over. You're not going to have a wand that you wind around and all of a sudden you are wealthy. But I can tell you, even in your struggles, wealth is looking for you. Even in that moment when you are broke, wealth is out there looking for you. There is a verse that troubled me, Basala. That's why I do so many things. Ne? There is a verse that troubles me in the Bible. It says, the riches of the ungodly are stored up for the righteous. That verse in for the sleepless nights. That's why I do so many. That's why I write books, I write music, I do all this. Because Basala, there is a pile of, of wealth waiting for me out there. That's what the Bible says. I said, no, I said, keep by me. Don't kill the messenger. You have to understand that the blessing is chasing after you. God can give you a, a strategy, a thought, an idea that can actually make you a millionaire overnight. Because blessings are actually looking for you. That's what the Bible tells us. So those are the visible signs that you are blessed. Number one, wealth will follow you. Number two, favor comes your way. Number two, favor will come looking for you. When we talk about favor, we're talking about the fact that sometimes you don't have to work hard for what people work hard for. People will just give it to you. That's favor. I shared a testimony on Friday that, you know, I, I got a job some other time where somebody just called me. Calls me and says, uh, man of God, uh, or rather, in fact, he didn't even know that I'm born again. Says to me, uh, my brother, I've got a job for you. Do, are you interested in getting this job? And I said, of course, I'm interested. And he said, how much do you want to get paid per month? I set my own salary in a job that I didn't go for an interview for. That's what we call favor. How about making some sense to somebody? So when you are blessed, favor comes following you. Number three, when you are blessed, productivity becomes evident. Productivity becomes evident. So in other words, the things that you do become productive. Even if it is not your own project, for the fact that you are there, productivity but they. Have you ever figured out why, why sometimes they hate you but they don't want you to go? Because they know that when you are there, there's always results. They, they, they wouldn't care less about you. They don't even want your guts. But they can't let you go because they can see there is somewhat a favor that's following you. That's what we call a blessing, Mazalot. Number four, you are surrounding, your surrounding inherits the favor from your blessing. When you are blessed, your surrounding inherits the favor from your blessing. So things start happening around you. Have you, have you ever had people ask you for money that you don't have? I've, I've seen a certain, you know, these, these memes that they throw around. You know, one of them saying, God, please give me the money that people think I have. <laughs> the reality is that they can see that there's something about you. Because your surrounding is impacted by the blessing. Why not you might not see it on the outside because you are looking for something. But God is saying, I've blessed you enough for others to see that around you there is a blessing. And number five, as we are about to close, oh God, my time. Number five, blessings are generational. So it doesn't end with you. The next generation will inherit the blessing. That's one thing you need to know, child of God. That blessings are hereditary. Blessings can be an inheritance. Say, I want to say Now, let's go back to the idea. Yahweh Abraham, uh, the, the blessing of Abraham is ours in Christ Jesus. So, we talked about priesthood, and we understand that the sense of, 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 of the word 
order is actually a word that comes from the essence of priesthood. I get what I want. Right. So, because we are talking about the essence of a priesthood now, let's define priesthood a, a little bit. A priest is a person who stands in front of God on behalf of men. Okay, so that is an inverse of what a prophet is. Okay, so if this is God, this is human beings, a priest stands in between and he's facing God. That's what a priest is. It's a person who represents men in front of God. A prophet is a person who stands before men on behalf of God. Okay, so uh, can I have two people demonstrate this? Can I have two, two brothers? Can you can, can please come, come quickly to the front? Don't worry, I'm not going to do anything funny. Yeah. yeah, can you stand here? Come and stand over here. So, if I am a priest... No, yeah, yeah, you can stand that way. If I am a priest, I'm going to be standing in between these people and I'll be facing God. You'll be God for today. <laughs> I'll be facing God. I'm carrying the problems of the people to God. If I'm a prophet, I've got a message from God. I'm facing the people. So I'm delivering the word from God to the people. So that is why I'm saying they are in verse, thank you. That is why I'm saying they are in verses of each other. So a priest is a person who stands in front of God on behalf of men. A prophet is a person who stands in front of men in, on the place of God. Are we making sense? In the entire Bible, there are only three categories of people who have ever become kings and priests. Only three people. Number one is Melchizedek. We have seen that. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1, it tells us that Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High. So the first person is Melchizedek, who was both a king and a priest in one person. The second person then is Christ. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I hope you are coming with me. So Christ becomes both a king and a priest in one person. But the third category of people then is you and me. Because Peter says you are a royal priesthood. That is why then we can only stand beyond the law. We cannot be under the law. Because the law separates the two. But now we are overqualified for the law. We are overqualified because in you lies a king and a priest. Together embodied in one person. That is why you can stand in front of God and ask for whatever you want in my name. It shall be given you. But you can also command whoever says to this mountain. Throw yourself in the sea it shall be done for you. Because there is also a king and a priest lying in the inside of you. Woo! Can I preach like I feel it this morning? So you need to understand then that God has dressed you with the same audacity that Melchizedek had. So the original blessing that was given to Abraham through Melchizedek actually resides in you. You've got the blessing of Melchizedek residing in you. You just have to activate it. You have to activate it because you got to understand that when God called you in Christ Jesus, he released a blessing in your life. Remember, a blessing is an empowerment to achieve something. So what God is saying then is, every time you step into a situation, step with the blessing that you have. I am too blessed to stay under the situation. I am too blessed to die poor. I am too blessed to die where I am. I am too blessed to can find myself controlled by circumstances. I am too blessed to be controlled by a boss who doesn't love me. I am too blessed to remain under this. I've got a blessing of God over my life. Now, now let, let, let's make it an example because I, I wanted to come home. I want you to see this in a clear picture. We've got a man called Jacob. Jacob in the Bible. Uh, all of you would know Jacob. Okay, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. So Abraham receives a blessing. He passes it on to Isaac. Isaac passes the blessing to Jacob. Now, let's see how the blessing worked in the life of Jacob. Jacob flees from his father, his brother Laban. He goes to the land of his uncle. Or rather, he flees from his brother Esau. He goes to his uncle's land, Laban. When he gets to Laban's house... He, all he has in his name is the clothes on his back. That's all. He didn't have anything. He didn't have a cent. All he had was the clothes. That, that, that's all in his name. His worth was the clothes on his back. 
walks into Laban's house. He works for, for seven years, gets the first wife. He works for seven years, gets the second wife. After 14 years, Laban says, man, you are too powerful for me. That's how a blessing operates. You can walk into an environment as an employee and become richer than your employer. Because when the blessing of God is enacted in your life, it doesn't matter what the situation is. It matters that I carry a blessing. When he goes back to the land of promise, the Bible says he had livestock that could not even be counted. He came as an employee. He gets out as a boss. That's how a blessing operates, Muzalwan. So when I say to you, you are blessed, born, anytime things can turn around in your life. When I say you are blessed, tomorrow you might be a CEO of a company. When I say you are blessed, tomorrow you might be borrowing people who are actually borrowing from you. When I say you are blessed, God is waiting for the right time to actually activate some finances in your life. Because when the blessing comes, uh, when the blessing comes your way, there is always a turnaround strategy from God. Woo! So it doesn't matter who it is that has been bossing you around in life. When God releases that blessing, your life turns around for the better. I'm here to talk to somebody today. I know, I know what you are talking about is, you know, it's probably true, but I haven't seen it in my life. It's just a matter of time. Somebody says it's a matter of time. I want you to believe it. Say it like you believe. It's a matter of time. It doesn't matter how hard your life has been until this far. You are working hard with a blessing. There is a difference. Too hard and nothing is coming together for them because they have absolutely nothing. When you are working too hard with a blessing in the inside. And any day things can turn around for your favor. Any day things can turn around for your favor. Because there is a blessing that resides in you. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessing of Abraham might come to you Gentiles. The blessing of Abraham, I told you already, they went into Egypt empty-handed. They came out there with wealth. That's the blessing of Abraham. Let's go to Genesis chapter 13. Maybe, maybe you don't get what I'm talking about. Let's go to Genesis 13. Sangenala Pogutiwa Ongena Konaga Kumi Sapumala You can never keep a blessed man down. You can never keep a blessed man down. Doesn't matter how hard you try, you will never keep a blessed man down. But God says, when man closes, I will open a door for you. When God opens a door, no man can close it. When God closes a door, no man can open it. You can't keep a blessed man down. Genesis 13 verse 1. Then Abraham, Abraham went, or rather, then Abraham went out from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Verse 2. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Genesis chapter 12. Abraham had nothing but the word of God. Absolutely nothing. All he had was go to the land I will show you and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. That's all that Abraham had. He goes to Egypt with that word. Goes to Egypt with I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. When he gets into Egypt, he comes out with wealth. You see, when God places his blessing on you, it's just a matter of time, Manamudi. But the blessing will always find a way of making you wealthy. Because the blessing of the Lord makes us rich. If you are not yet rich, the blessing is still working. If you are not yet rich, the blessing is still activated. It's an assignment. Because the blessing of God ultimately needs to make you rich. 
and he adds no sorrow in it. I hope I'm making sense to somebody. God is saying to you and I today, I've got a blessing bestowed in Christ for you. Zawani, you are not supposed to struggle for the rest of your life. Not with the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Not with the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus. You can't struggle for the rest of your life. It's just a matter of time until God brings a turn around in your life. I hope I'm making sense to somebody. It's just a matter of time. And God says, you've got a priest and a king residing in you. You can pray to God. You can also command situations. Look at whatever you've been going through and tell it time is up. Now I know the truth. <laughs> now I know that I'm a blessed one of God. Now I know that the blessing of Abraham is active in my life. Situation you are not going to stay here for too long. Because now I know who I am in Christ Jesus. Let's rise on our feet as we close. Whew. The blessing that God has bestowed on your life, child of God, can break boundaries. I told you not long ago, I think it was last night, I was quoting Strive Masiwa. Strive Masiwa studied uh, electrical engineering. That's all he studied. As we speak right now, he owns a telecommunication network. It runs in Zimbabwe, it runs in Malawi, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, when I was in Malawi, Airtel was there. It runs in Malawi, it runs in a number of countries. The only black-owned, licensed network uh, operation owned by Strive Masiu. That man is a Christian. He's the very same man who was speaking against corruption. That man is a Christian. He loves God. In fact, he's friends with Bishop Noaka. How many of you know Bishop Noaka? Ah, if you are in Change Bible Church, you know Bishop Noaka. He's friends with Bishop Noaka. Bishop Noaka says, if I give that man the pulpit, he preaches better than me. A Christian businessman. And he sees active the blessing of God. One day, uh, in fact, some few years back, I'm not sure which year, what, I think it was 2019, there was a strike of doctors in Zimbabwe. The whole Zimbabwe, the doctors were striking because the government could not pay them. Strive Masi, who are offered to pay them for six months. I'm talking about doctors in the entire country. Strive offered to pay them for six months while the, the government is getting itself together. That's how God wants to make you wealthy. If you are still surrounded with your, I'm blessed as long as I've got my family and I'm okay. <laughs> you are still far from the blessing of Abraham. God wants to make you wealthy because like we said before, for God so loved the world. There's so many things that God wants to do in this world that will require you and me to be blessed enough to be the hands of God in a dying world. For corruption to stop, Bazalwani, it's going to take you and me having money, sponsoring legitimate projects. Until those who are actually taking money illegitimately don't have a place to bribe. Because we've got enough money. That's what God is looking for. If God is going to fix this country, it's going to raise you and I to become millionaires. And I'm praying and I'm praying, oh God, help us to understand the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Because if we can understand that we are blessed, we will break boundaries. We will break limitations. Nothing will contain you. As long as you know that you are blessed, no container will contain you. A blessing will break open the container. Father, we thank you for your word. We appreciate you. We honor you, God Almighty. And we appreciate all that you have said to us. May you help us walk in the blessing that you have already released in our lives. May you help us understand that we are already blessed. We are not looking for blessings. We are already blessed. And I pray for breakthroughs in each and every person's life. That Father, open that door. Give him that idea that will make them to experience a turnaround overnight. 
I pray, Heavenly Father, for the blessing of Abraham to be activated in each and every individual. As a young generation, looking forward to the next generation, having a generational assignment, help us to step into the blessing that you have already enacted for us in Christ Jesus. All this I ask for you is I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Thank <laughs> you.